you're living proof. Amen. Thank you. this side of heaven than your salvation and the glory and the joy of being born again. If you'd look with us this morning to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 11, we begin reading Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 11. We're certainly proud to have you this morning. We're not too far. They, they talk like Christmas is coming. If the world stays its course, it'll be the 25th of December one of these days. Today is the 25th of November, so that would put us just almost exactly one month away from the day our Savior, Jesus Christ, was born in a manger. What a joy to look forward to that. Here we are in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to start reading in verse number 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and perfect and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Lord, we worship you this morning and we thank you so much for the hope that you poured into the human race through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and that any man, woman, boy or girl that lives on this earth and under heaven could call upon you and confess and could find their way with you, Lord. For this we thank you this morning and we ask you that the continuance of your redemptive power be poured fresh out in our lives and in those that we make contact with, Lord, that we could be carriers of this great gospel. And we'll thank you for it now in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I want to speak to you this morning from <clears throat> verse number 12. Verse number 12 ends up saying, having obtained, and notice this word here, eternal redemption for us. I want to talk to you for just a little bit about the power of redemption. Several years ago, our youngest daughter and Randy's son, Chad, I think they were born about, was it a day, one day difference, one day's difference in, in them. And uh, I didn't know what was going on, but they was about five or six, both of them, and they come running into the house, and Jessica had Chad by the hand. And they was running, I mean, they come through the door, right through the living room, right in there, and behind her bed, him and her got down over, over behind the bed and they went to crying out to God. Connie was raising some turkeys and uh, they, uh, the hen had set and, and had several chicks that was about half grown, turkey chicks, and uh, a pit bulldog had come down to our house and caught one of them. And Jessica got Chad, and she was saying, we just got one chance at this deal, and that's go cry out to God. And so when they was telling, well, as they was coming through the house that the, the dog had caught the turkeys. And I thought, well, goodbye, turkey. <laughs> well, I run outside 
trying to be part of the answer of their prayer. And here comes this dog with a turkey hung. He had caught this turkey, this about half grown turkey, right in the breast. And his, he, he opened his mouth and tried to spit it out, but it was hung on his canines. And so I caught him, got the turkey, and uh, kicked the dog. I kicked the thunder out of him. <laughs> That's for all you tree huggers. I kicked him on purpose. <laughs> and I turned that turkey loose that was caught by the dog, and that turkey just took off kind of waddling and running around, but it lived. And its redemption depended on the prayer of them two five or six year old babies that run in there and fell down before the Lord and believed God, even for a turkey, that that turkey could make it. Now you're probably full of turkey. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you one thing, the world we live in is not full of God. But they need God. And God has redemption. If he cares for a little old turkey about what two kids is weeping and crying over, you can know how much more does he care for the souls of man. In this passage of scripture he talked about the blood of bulls and goats and heifers and all of that. And how much more powerful is the blood of Jesus Christ. If you could take a red heifer that had no white on her and kill her and burn her down to ashes and take those ashes and sprinkle them in water. Even if a person had touched a dead man or woman he could, he could, he could have that water sprinkled on him and it was the water of separation and cleansing and, and that in the eyes of God and in the eyes of the law of Moses and in the eyes of those people they were all of a sudden because they had obeyed God and, and had the ashes of the red heifer sprinkled over them in that water they were clean and he's talking about to us how much more the redemptive power of God. So I want to talk to you about the power of redemption redemption. Because of the power of redemption, you don't have to rust out. And you don't have to burn out. And you don't have to give out. And you don't have to do like some of the tars that Brother Messick works on. You don't have to blow out. <laughs> If you really get a hold of the redemptive power of God, you can live out your life until you get to the portals of glory. Amen. Because of the Armenian concept of the scripture, which means you could get right with God and backslide and go to hell, we don't preach eternal security. Not without responsibility. But there are scriptures that talks about eternally being secure. But you must be responsible for what you're doing. That's real. That's biblical. That's attested to in many scriptures. One of them that's so powerful is 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 10. Where the gospel goes down through there in the early part of that chapter. Building people up. In verse 4, he's telling you that God gives you everything you need to make it. And here in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 10, look what he says. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. So eternal security should be preached, but not without responsibility. You are responsible for your actions. You can't act like no goat and be a sheep. Even Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, he was going to separate the sheep from the goats. The ones that look like it or talk like it, but did not have it. The hope here is that our redemption goes plumb down into our spiritual man. That where we're not just full of something we say with our mouth, but we actually got so close to Jesus that we act out the presence of Christ for the rest of our life. One of the first things that's so powerful about redemption is the freedom from guilt. Guilt is a horrible thing to carry. 
and to try to hide. You've heard people look at you and say, you look guilty. Well, when you're ducking plumb down behind the pew, I don't have to say you look guilty. I know you are. Who among us hasn't been guilty sometime? When you read Romans chapter 3, verse number 23, it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We don't need Jesus because we were righteous. We need him because we was lost. Hallelujah. And we want to get away from being lost. And we want to live in the power and the glory of the redeemed person that's not lost, but he's, woo, he's found by the grace of God. I was pretty awed just recently. In fact, it was, I guess it was the, I was waiting for the Thanksgiving parade to come on. Connie said it was coming on, so I was looking around. I couldn't find it, but I did find the Meacham Auto Sales. That's where they sell these high-end automobiles, hot rods and stuff like that. And this one car from 1967 had been kept up. It looked just like it did when it rolled off the showroom floor, so they said. It was one of eight Corvettes in 1967 that had a 427 and 427 horsepower. It had all, all the stuff on it, the bells and whistles. It was yellow. They started bidding, and that car went up to a million and seven hundred thousand dollars. What was they saying? It wasn't a piece of junk. They said that thing has been taken care of. It's been kept up. It's still alive. It's not in the junkyard. It's not some piece of, uh, what are they made out of? Uh, not steel. What is it? Fiberglass. fiberglass. Now you're talking. <laughs> Can you believe that somebody would give nearly $2 million for a fiberglass car? And did you know the man that owned it put a seal on it and said, if it don't bring $2 million, it'll still be mine after it leaves the auction. And because it only brought a million seven hundred thousand, he took it home with a grin on his face. I just want to tell you, friends, you're worth more to God than the stingray that was built in 1967. And what he wants to do is not present you as a rusted out bucket or a broken piece of fiberglass to his father, but he wants to present you as a redeemed person, redeemed out of the hells of sin into the righteousness of Christ, not guilty. Isn't it neat to face your life and say, I was that, but I'm not that any longer, and I don't belong in that world. And verse number 14, only God can get this done, but he talks about here in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, and notice these words, purge your conscience. It's not that you don't know what you was, but it, it's the fact that you recognize what I was, I ain't any longer. <laughs> Woo! And so you start walking away from the guilt of yesterday. Two days, three days, three weeks, three months. The glory of the Lord magnifies your life. And you walk away from your guilt. We looked at that scripture for just a moment in Romans chapter 3 verse 23 where he talked about all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And reading on down in those next verses in Romans chapter 3 verse 24, he says... Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What we got came free. He washed us, he sanctified us, he justified us, and he set us back on the road of life. And he says, Woo! You can live now because I have forgiven you. You're not guilty any longer. You're free by the grace of God. Look at verse number 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, speaking of Jesus through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness. Uh-oh. I don't know if I ought to read this to y'all or not, but... There are teachings where they say when you get saved that Jesus forgives you of all your sins past and all your sins present. 
and all your sins future. You don't never have to ask for repentance again. It's a little contrary to this scripture I'm fixing to read to you because he says when you get saved, here's where you start at. To declare his righteousness, back in verse 25, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are that are what? That are past. That means what you was before he forgives you for that. But he owns you now and he expects you to stay purdy. Woo! And he expects you to stay clean. He forgives your past, but he expects your future to be a walk in the righteousness of Christ. Friends, that's why you don't have to stay guilty, because you don't go back to what you was. You're freed from those chains of darkness. That's why we sang the song, thank God I'm free from this world of sin. Been washed in the blood of Jesus. I'm born again. You may have come in here a straight out adulterer or whoremonger, but you leave and you know Jesus, you're not that no more. You're a new creature in Christ. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17 that the old things pass away. And behold, all things become new. I love when you're shouting now. Where does all of this remission of sins that are past come? Through the forbearance of God. Look at this next verse, verse 26. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Friend, it's not because of what we done, but it's because what Jesus done through us. That he washed our sins away and he raises us up to live a life away from sin. We don't belong to sin. No longer. Woo! We belong to the shed blood of Jesus and we begin to prove very Christ in the way we live. That's the glory of being a Christian. It's not being guilty every day and coming in like a Come on now. We was at a marriage conference some years ago, and uh, the man that was teaching had never been married, but he made a statement I'll never forget. He said, every time you bring flyers home, your wife wonders what you did. <laughs> <laughs> what are these for? <laughs> we should live such a life that the no is on the inside. That I know that you, come on now. Woo! <laughs> I knew you couldn't stand much of that. I just had to give you a little shot. In John chapter 1 and verse number 11, Jesus Christ says that he went to his own and his own received him not. But to as many, in verse 12, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power. Did you see that word? P-O-W-E-R. He gave them power to become something that never been before. Not the sons of the devil or the sons of Belial, but the Son of God, hallelujah, even to them that believe on his name. We believe with such fervency that we want to be like him. Woo! I don't never want to be what I was before I come to Jesus. I want to be that new creature. In Acts, I'm sorry, in John chapter 3, verse number 17, the Bible says that God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In Acts chapter 26, we'll start reading about verse number 9. Paul is standing before Agrippa. Festus, during this time, will say that Paul has went crazy. And some people, if you leave your life of sin and live the rest of your life in righteousness, they're going to look at you and say, he's crazy too. <laughs> but let it be so. Live such a life that they'll have to say, whatever they say, he's different than what he was. <laughs> Hallelujah. The power of redemption, freeing us from guilt. Here is Paul talking about killing Christians. He gives his testimony to Agrippa. Look at these words. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. 
which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Why is he free to tell his testimony? Because he recognizes God has forgiven me, but he wants to show Agrippa, I come out of that hell hole of religion, and I found Jesus. I'm not a religious man no more. I've been born again. I belong to Jesus Christ, and I'm going to live for Jesus, and I've been set free by the grace of God. He goes on. We don't have time to read the rest of it, but he goes on and, get, and tells him that I was struck down on the road to Damascus, and the Lord raised me up, and he said, I raised you up for a reason, to carry this gospel back to the Gentile and tell them what God's done for you. Woo! Friends, we need to be carriers. Even the world, if you claim Christianity, the world expects you to tell the truth. Yes. They expect you to live right, spit white, and breathe clear. No vapor. I love when you shout now. Y'all didn't know if I was going to get that out, did you? Yeah. There's an old song that says, I'm free at last. Brother Clinton, and I don't know how many times we got to be in his services there at Victory Temple that always sang this. For so long I searched for life meaning, enslaved by the world and my greed. Not like the, not like the songs of today when it's all about me. <laughs> enslaved by the world and my greed, my greed for it. Then the door to my prison was opened by love. The ransom was paid, and I am free. Woo! I'm free from the fear of tomorrow, and I'm free from the guilt of my past. I've traded my shackles for a glorious song, Woo! and I'm free. Praise the Lord. I'm free at last. That's free from guilt to know, yes, I did those things, but thank God, I'm free by the grace of God. They honed in on Connie and I several years ago when we took a stand in Snyder, Texas, not by ourselves, but along with several other people against what was being taught in our school system. We got some calls, several calls. One of them was kind of funny. Some of the people that had known me and Connie whenever she was so wild. <laughs> they said if y'all don't hush that up talking about all this uh, stuff that's going on in the school system, we're going to tell your church what y'all used to do. <laughs> Connie said, well, go right ahead. They all know that's what we was, but we ain't that no more. We have been forgiven. Woo! Hallelujah. Free from the fear of tomorrow. Woo! Free from the guilt of the past. That is the power of redemption. Friends, if you're still guilty, you need to bring it to Jesus and throw it down on the altar and let it die and walk away from it. If you've been an avid cusser right up till this morning, today should be your last day to ever bring shame to the name of Jesus. Walk out and leave it behind. If you've got porn on your phone this morning, it ought to be the last time you ever open that up in your app. Somebody would just shout. I'm talking about you don't have to be guilty. You can be free by the power of God. Freedom is through redemption. So redeemed you don't want to go back Amen. to sin. Amen. The second thing in the power of redemption that's so, so beautiful is free from dead works. We're no longer just mouth. We're actually living a Christian life. Talk, they say, is cheap. But to put on the line the actual walk of Christ where you're living from day to day, down at the grocery store or at the gas station or out on the job when your hackles are risen up <laughs> and you're being needled and punctured or maybe in your high school or in your elementary class 
the stuff comes up and out of you comes things that's not like Christ. We can break that by the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. Jesus so redeems humanity that they're not the same no more. They're not the same by the grace of God. Notice verse number 14. We'll go back to it. So it's so beautiful in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, that is redemptive blood, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience and then notice what the problem was with the conscience was. Dead works. The conscience is struggling with how can I say I'm a Christian and I'm still living like the devil. And friends, when you get to Jesus, that world right there is broken. You're not just a professor any longer, but you have stepped up to the plane and you are possessing the power of redemption that yes, I'm gone from that and now I'm going to start producing. Woo! Oh, hallelujah. What my eyes see, what my ears hear, the way I walk, the way I read, the way I act. In fact, my altitude, oh, my attitude has come down. Finally. Woo! P-R-I-D has been broken. And you get those scriptures like only by pride comes contention. If I'm throwing a fit, it's because the devil is in front of me and he got my goat. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's Christ-like to throw a fit and act up like a two-year-old? My daddy never let us get down on the floor. We didn't even head towards it. Yeah, y'all can't stand that, but I'm just telling you about the real world. Come on. Purge you from what? Dead works to serve. We're purged for a reason. Purged from dead works to do what? Not to be dead no more, but to start our life serving Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, my heart was so lifted up. We had a funeral Tuesday at 2 o'clock and... We fed the family, and no, nobody hardly in our church knew knew these people. And so I felt real squeamish about uh, squeamish about asking our girls that just cooked Sunday. So Con and her sister cooked for them, and there was a host of people that come and cleaned the church, cleaned the kitchen, cleaned the fellowship hall, cleaned the bathrooms, cleaned the auditorium. I just want to tell you, there ain't no dead works in there. That's that's living it out, making it work beautifully. And uh, when they got through with it, it looked dirty. And so here comes a crew of people back. And they clean the fellowship hall again. Oh, yeah, the same day. Yeah, I mean, he's still in the business. And they went back through the kitchen. And they're coming auditorium and straightened it up for the Tuesday night service. It was on Wednesday. Come on now. I'm just telling you, friends, when you get right with God, something changes on the inside. You're not just mouthing that you was a Christian, but the very actions that comes out of your life become so real that the people can say like they did in Antioch. We know one thing, that these people have been with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. Woo! I just pray to God that when you're seen out on the street and in this world that people look you over and can say that person is a Christian Woo! by the way they act the way they dress well we could spend the rest of the service right there some of these men wearing these little old not enough to clean the bore on the 22 boy you get your britches on Help me pull them up, get you a job, yes. clip them, yeah. Yes. Woo! In Titus chapter 2 and verse number 11, he starts trotting down through us on grace, talking to us, loving on us. He says the grace of God that's appeared to all men does something. He starts teaching us, hallelujah. What? What's he teaching us? Not to have dead works, but a living proof of God. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We 
should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Not very many people ever equate grace with that teaching right there. But there it is in your Bible in Titus chapter 2 verses 11 and 12. And then he takes us the next step. We start looking for something besides Walmart. We're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might, and here's that word, this is what redemption is all about, that he might redeem us from how much all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Man, you ought to go around the house saying, thank God I'm free from this world of sin. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus and I'm born again. Hallelujah. That'll run the devil off. Yes. Woo. Free from guilt. Free from dead works. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 29 and 30, he talks about we are made, he's made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. In Galatians chapter 3, in verse number 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Brother Justin started our lesson this morning about a minister. Brother Graham talking about that salvation does not come by litigation. It's not the law no more. It's a love relationship that I'm, I'm serving him because I love him. Woo! I want it that way. And that's the way we serve Christ. He talks about here, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. It's not just a bunch of letters against us, but it's a love affair. Whoa, I chose Jesus as my Savior. And he chose me back to live for him. And so those works become a natural way, a natural response. That's why the preacher has to tell, well, maybe, yeah, well, this is the way it used to go. Uh, you may kiss the bride. Here's that boy standing there. He's all shook up. He just got married. Yeah. That becomes a natural way of life between a man and a woman that's formed a monogamy. Friends, did you know the Bible says, kiss the son lest he be angry with thee and you perish from the way? What he's talking about is not a physical kiss. He's talking about us living so close to him that not a day goes by that we're not holding his hand and, and right, walking right in his footsteps and listening at his words and hearing what he's got to say and living the walk. I mean, our, our relationship with Christ is so close. That's why we stay away from the stuff from yesterday. Day. No more dead works. We're living the overcomer's life. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 14, he talks about redemption through his blood and forgiveness. Look at this scripture. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's Galatians. In Colossians chapter 1 verse number 14, almost like it. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Woo! What joys that we can be free from dead works in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation or your old lifestyle, which you received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The Lord has set us apart. Amen. The remission of sins from the past that we can raise up and live in the glory of the future of the believer as we walk with Christ. In closing this evening, there's one more thing or this morning, not evening yet. There's one more thing I'd like to talk to you about for just a few moments. The power of redemption frees us from guilt and frees us from dead works. And the power of redemption frees us to live tomorrow. We don't just get saved and die and that's the end of it. I mean, there is people that that's happened to. If you do, you get to live forever with Christ. 
And if you stay here, you have a tomorrow of proving Christ in your life and the joy of allowing the world to look you over and scrutinize you. And they got every right to. And to see that you're living in the light. If you, if you go back to verse number 12 of Hebrews chapter 9, it says, Having obtained what? Eternal redemption for us. That's what Jesus bought. That's the power. Not only just salvation here, but eternal redemption. If we stay... If we stay the course until Jesus comes for us, eternal redemption is ours for the taking. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 19 and 20, Paul puts it in such plain words. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 19. Look what he says here. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. What he's saying, that Jesus Christ, because he come out of the grave, we're going to be just like him. And if we die and we live for him till we die, we're going to come out of the grave. We have eternal redemptive hope that we're going to be with him, free to live a future and a tomorrow with Christ. In verse number 28 of, the, of Hebrews chapter 9, our text, in verse number 28 it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. My mother as a very young lady watched her grandmother pass into the hands of the Lord. And they was there, some of the family, and she says that her grandmother, a Christian lady, was just laying there in the bed, getting, she was right, right at the verge. And uh, she just says, please come get me, sweet Jesus. <laughs> and that's the last thing that ever come out of her mouth, the last breath she took, and she just zipped off into the glories with the Lord. What, what a joy when you're preaching a funeral and you know from the family that the man or woman or boy or girl lived their life for Christ. And we've got this grand hope of eternal. That what we, what we got in Christ, He saved us. We walked the line. And then whenever we die, we're going right on in. We're going to just keep living. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. He said, if, to be absent from this body is to be where? <laughs> Is to be present with the Lord. What hope we have in Jesus Christ. I don't know how long since you've looked at the talents in Matthew chapter 5 and verse, or chapter 25 and verse number 20. Here's the man that was given five talents. He's made ten talents out of it. And look what Jesus says. And this is recorded again about the man with two talents. And so he that had received the five talents came and brought other five talents. So what's he been doing? All the time the master of the house is gone. Jesus is in heaven. He's the master of our house. He's coming back. That's the promise. But all the time he's gone, this boy with his five talents, he's been investing them and working on them. And he's brought those five talents up to ten talents. He's proven his, his love for Christ and his work, saying, Lord, thou delivered this unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides them five talents more. And look what Jesus said. This is his promise. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou in to the joy of the Lord. Woo! The man with two talents received the same commission. It's going to be there. If you go to the sheep and goats in the same chapter, he says, come on in here. All the things that I've made for you, you can go enter, enter into them. They're yours for the taking. Friends, I just want to tell you that your redemption is not just on Sunday, but it should be seven days a week, 12 months out of the year until the day that Jesus calls you home. And so good that when we do pass, we pass with this knowledge 
that because of the power of His redemption, we have the joy of living eternally with Christ. We're free to live on. Would you stand with me this morning? And would you come to the piano? Some of y'all, if you want to come and sing or, or help us during the altar time, you feel free to do so. It's not uncommon for people to carry guilt, even that's been forgiven. And a lot of times it's because they don't know the power of redemption. That when you come to Jesus, whatever you have done is not only forgiven, but by God it is forgotten. The Lord talks about your pardon and mine, that when we come to Christ, He forgets our sins and puts them as far from Him as the East is from the West. That's why scriptures like Philippians chapter 3 where Paul says, forgetting those things that are behind me, I press forward toward the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. If you're here this morning and the devil has been beating you up over guilt of the past, with heads bowed, and you're here, you say, Pastor, I'm one of those. I and through His eternal redemptive power can set you free from your guilts of yesterday. Anybody in this room says, Pastor, here's, here's one already. Thank you. Here's another one right here. I want to be free from my guilt by the power of God. Anybody else in this building? We're going to be praying here in just a few moments and believe in God to lift you up away from that because the Scripture says the Lord is here to set you free from your guilt. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I've been a claimer, but I have not been living the walk that you talked about today. How that Jesus not only saves us, but he pulls us out of litigation and lets us walk on and really prove to the world that we're a viable Christian. I want to improve my walk with Jesus. Anybody in that free of dead works is what the scripture talks about. Anybody in that business, Lord, I, I want to be better at living my overcomer's life. And by an uplifted hand, you want prayer in that area of your life this morning. Right here's a hand. Thank you so much for being tender. God in our life, let us be tender before you. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I'm just not a Christian, but I hear what you're saying. I want to go to heaven. I'm not right, but I want to get saved. Anybody in that area of your life, we want to pray with you this morning and believe the Lord to touch your soul today. Lord, we thank you this morning as we get ready to come around these altars for these hands that's been raised. And we're asking you today, Lord, would you separate us from the guilt of yesterday that we could walk away and be free by the grace of God, leaving it behind. And Lord, for those that want their works to be powerful, Lord, not dead works, but so alive that the world can look at us and see Christ in us. Let a special anointing come upon us God to prove very Christ in the way we live and for these things we want to worship you and we thank you for it this evening this morning in the name of Jesus these altars are open would you come today let the Lord refresh you with this power of redemption